ever get that like heart in your throat feeling, you know, right before you have to speak in front of people? Oh, absolutely. Like everyone gets it right. Yeah, totally, totally. And it's funny because you would think that even the best speakers would be like immune to it. Right. But turns out that is something that we all kind of grapple with. It's true. And um, that's what we're going to be diving into today. We are cracking open Dale Carnegie's How to Develop Self-Confidence and Influence People by Public Speaking. A classic. The classic. So even though it might seem like maybe a little bit dated, like some of these self-help books can be, right. it's actually got some really relevant stuff. Yeah, they really do, yeah. So let's just jump right in. What is the the magic bullet? Okay, so the first thing that Carnegie talks about is like, it's not about eliminating fear. It's about developing courage, right? Oh, okay. So like, you're never gonna be fearless. Right. But you could develop the courage to kind of like push through that fear. So like mastering it, not letting it master you. Exactly. Yeah. And he gives this great example of William Jennings Bryan. Okay. Who, if you don't know, he was the cross of gold orator. He was like fantastic speaker. I don't know him off the top of my head. Okay. So, but like very, very famous for giving speeches. Yeah. And like he was known for having such bad stage fright that like his knees would knock together. Oh, wow. Can you imagine? But, and it's so funny because you, you read these like historical speeches and you think. They just float out of them. Yeah. Like, oh, they just, you know, effortlessly delivered this. Yeah. But it's like they really, really struggle. Oh, absolutely. So it's good to know. Again, you you know, we're not just talking about like Brian. Wait. Mark Twain, right? Like, oh, wow. The humorist, like the, the king of wit. He, his first time having to like lecture. Yeah. He said it felt like his mouth was full of cotton. Oh, no. Yeah. And so. I think that kind of makes us feel a little less unique in our own stage fright, right? Totally. If these titans of language, if they felt fear, then like, we're probably okay. Okay, so that's that's really reassuring actually. You know, that we're not alone in this. You're not alone. But, um, so if running away from the fear is not the answer, right? what does Carnegie say that we should be doing? So he, he was really a huge advocate for something called reserve power. Reserve power. Reserve power. And it's this idea that like, imagine feeling so prepared. Okay. So knowledgeable about your topic that you could handle any question thrown at you. Okay. Any curveball, like you have that reserve of knowledge. Okay, so it's like becoming like a mini expert on your subject, even if you don't use all of that. Yeah, you're not gonna use all of it. Right but you have it. Okay. And that just fuels your confidence. That makes sense. And like, he uses this great example of Lincoln. Okay. And and his preparation for the Gettysburg Address. You would think for like, such a short, iconic speech. Right, and famous. That he just like, stood up there and delivered it. Yeah. But he spent weeks, even months, like, crafting that. He would jot down notes, he would refine his ideas. He even, um, the night before he delivered it, he was up with his Secretary of State, William Seward. Wow. Getting feedback. Talk about dedication. Right. He was really, really committed. So he took it very seriously. Yeah. Okay, so it's not just these, like, big speeches that, right. you know, that we think of. Presidents and facts. presidents, exactly. He also talks about this um, journalist, Ida Tarbell. Okay. Who, she was assigned this what should have been like <laughs> a simple article okay. about the Atlantic cable. Okay. So pretty straightforward, right? Interview the cable manager, done. She goes to the British Museum, Whoa. starts reading about the history of cables. Oh my goodness. She visits factories to see how cables are made. For this one article. For this one article. That's amazing. And this is what he means by reserve power. Okay. Because she had so much more knowledge than she could ever put into that article, but it gave her the confidence to write it well. That is so interesting. So it's like, Going above and beyond, not necessarily for the final product, but for yourself to feel that confidence. Yes. Wow. Okay, so we've got conquer the fear, we've got over prepare, essentially. Yeah. Right. What else? So the next thing that he goes into is memory. Oh, yes. Because like, how frustrating is it when your mind goes blank? The one. Mid speech. And it happens to all of us, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. And he says it all starts with observation, believe it or not. Okay. He tells this really interesting story about Thomas Edison. Okay. Who challenged his assistants to observe a cherry tree. 
A cherry tree. That they passed every day on their way to work. Okay. For months. Okay. And then he's like, okay, tell me about this cherry tree. And nobody could remember anything about it. Oh, wow. Because they were so used to just like walking past it, they weren't really observing. It's like our brain is on autopilot sometimes. You're well, just not present. Exactly. And he's in Carnegie saying, that's what we do all the time. Interesting. We go through life not really observing, and that's why our memories are bad. Okay, that's fascinating. And so he says that, you know, the keen observation is like the heart of a good memory. Okay. And then he goes on to say that there are all these systems, right, for for helping you to improve your memory. Right. And one of the ones that he talks about is like using these vivid pictures <laughs> to help you remember things. Okay, so like how would that work? So let's say that like you want to remember a list, right? Yep. You would associate each item on that list with some crazy image okay. that you can remember. So like, let's say your first item is a racehorse. Okay. Your second item is a zoo. Right. You know, and so on and so forth. So you're you're just making like these, connection. these, these outlandish connections that will help you remember. Because the more outlandish it is, the more you'll remember it. Right, okay, interesting. And like, I, I do this, I use this all the time for like, my grocery list. Do you really? I yeah. do. Yeah. That's a great idea because I don't know. I always I'm like repeating it in my head over and over again. Yeah, it's so boring. It's so boring. And you forget it anyway. This is much more fun. Yeah. And then another thing he talks about is um, is space repetition. Space repetition. Okay. So this is like the idea that if you want to remember something long term, right. don't cram. Okay. Review it consistently over time. Right. Like watering a plant. Exactly. A little bit every day. A little bit every day. And he, he relates it back to, you know, physical exercise. Right. He says, if you if you lift a dumbbell once, it's not going to make a difference. Right. It's consistency. Exactly. Okay. This is good. This is good to know because I was starting to get a little overwhelmed. I'm yeah. like, oh my gosh. It's not just about the content of your speech. It's like. It's everything. You have to memorize it all perfectly. Right. But okay, so we've talked about like the, the m mental game of public speaking. We've talked about preparation. We've talked about kind of like training our brains to remember. Yes. But what about like the actual delivery? Like how we use our voice, how we present ourselves? So he was a really big proponent of what he called enlarged naturalness. Enlarged naturalness. Okay, um. so essentially what he means by that is like, speak as if you're having a conversation. Okay but just amplified. Okay. Okay, see. So like don't put on this like presentation voice right. to yourself, but just bigger. Exactly. Okay. And he he uses Lincoln and Douglas okay. as like contrasting examples of that. Okay. So both very powerful speakers, right? Right. But Luskin had this very like folksy, charming right. storytelling style. Yes. Douglas was much more like polished and formal. Oh. But like, they were both effective in their own way. Right? right. Interesting. So it's about finding finding what works for you. Yes. And not trying to be like somebody else. Right. And he, he really cautions against being wooden in your delivery. Yeah. Because he's like, sincerity mm -hmm. and passion are always going to be more captivating. Yes than just like trying to sound like right. some sort of like orator, you know? Like a robot, basically. Exactly, Apparently, like yeah. people can spot that from a mile away. Right, right. Be authentic, basically. Exactly. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so we've talked about the mental game, we've talked about finding your natural voice. Yes. But what about the nuts and bolts of the speech? Okay, yes, let's get into it. So like how to start, how to end, Yeah. how to, you know, really like grab the audience's attention. Yeah, all the good stuff. All the good stuff. Cardies, like, insider tips. Exactly. And so he has <laughs> he has this really interesting, um, he talks about openings. Okay. And he actually cautions against starting with a joke. <gasps> really? I know. Which seems counterintuitive. Yeah, because you think, like, icebreaker. Yeah, you want to get people laughing. Yeah. He's like, Unless you're like a really funny person okay, and you know what you're doing, it's probably not a good idea. Don't bomb right off the bat. Don't bomb right off the bat. Yeah. He says like some of the best openings, uh -huh. you know, things. Um, and he gives these great examples. He, he talks about how Charles Dickens okay. would often start his speeches by recounting the experience that gave him the idea for a Christmas carol. Oh, wow. That's good. Talk about a way to like <laughs> oh, cook your audience. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, he talks about how Lowell Thomas, who is this like news commentator, okay. started a speech with just this 
like really vivid description of Lawrence of Arabia. Okay. Like no introduction, just like boom, description. Right into it. And then like Russell Conwell's Acres of Diamonds <laughs> speech, which if you don't know, you should look it up. It's like a yeah. very famous speech. Okay. But his opening is so captivating. It's all about this like Persian farmer. Okay. Who's like searching for, for riches, for diamonds. Right. And he like travels the world and he never finds them. Oh. And then he comes home and it turns out his farm was sitting on a mine of diamonds. Oh my God. This whole time. Wow. And that's how he opens the speech. And then he connects it to like the idea that mm -hmm. opportunity is often right in front of us. Oh, I love that. Oh, yeah. So powerful. And like so relevant too. I feel like that's a very timeless message. Very much so. And then he talks about closes. Okay. Yes. Because those are important. Yes. How do you, how do you leave a lasting impression? Yes. And he says, brevity and impact are key. Okay. He highlights um, a time that the Prince of Wales ended a speech. Okay. By just like very humbly acknowledging his own shortcomings. Oh, wow. Which is kind of power move. Right. Because that makes you seem more relatable. Yes, exactly. And more human. And more human. Um, think about Lincoln's like second inaugural address. Right. Those closing lines. Yeah, yeah. Just so poetic and powerful. Amazing how a few words can be so impactful. Absolutely. And then on the complete other end of the spectrum, he talks about Lloyd George, oh, yeah. who once used a humorous story about John Wesley right. to close a speech about the importance of maintaining Wesley's tomb. Wait, what? Yeah, so he he found a way to tie this like humorous anecdote right. back to his main message. Okay. So it wasn't just like a random funny story. Right, so it was relevant? It was relevant, exactly. Okay. So I think what we're seeing here is this theme of storytelling. Yes. Carnegie was a huge believer in the power of stories. Yes. To make your message memorable, to make it relatable, right. connect with people on a human level. Make those connections. Exactly. Yeah, because stories are something that we all kind of like we'll connect, connect with. Yeah. Absolutely. No matter what walk of life you come from or Yep, yep. And even though, you know, he talks about stories and and he clearly thinks that humor can be used effectively. Right. He was adamant that every speech, no matter how short or informal, should have a purpose. Okay, so it's not just about entertainment. Not just entertainment. Yeah. There has to be like a, a point to it. A point to it. And he actually, he tells this story about how Abraham Lincoln okay. once tried to give a lecture and it was purely for entertainment. Okay. It did not go well. Oh no. It did not go well. And I think what he's trying to highlight there is that like, even Lincoln, right. with all of his experience and natural ability, he struggled when he didn't have that clear why. So knowing your why is important. Knowing your why is crucial. Whether it's to persuade or inform or entertain or like... Or inspire. Means... There has to be a reason okay. for, for you to be speaking. Yeah, okay. And and then I guess once you know your why, like how do you go about actually make sure, sure. that it comes through? Right. So he offers some, some really practical advice. And... And one of the things he talks about is using language okay. that resonates with your audience. So ditch the jargon. Ditch the jargon. Mm -hmm. He gives this great example of um, these missionaries in Africa okay. who were trying to explain the size of a cathedral to a local tribe. And they, at first, they were using all these measurements. Right, that they wouldn't understand. That they wouldn't understand, right. Meters and feet. Yeah. And, right. and the tribe was just like, what are you talking about? Yeah. So finally, they were like, okay, we're going to describe it as being as large as 20 of your huts. Right. So putting it in terms that they could understand, that they could connect with. Exactly. And Carnegie is saying, we need to all do that. Okay. Whether yeah. we're talking about, you know, square footage or atoms. Right. Try to translate it into something, into something your audience can grasp. Yeah. Okay. So, Don't just say, you know, 20 feet high. Say no. one and a half times the height of this room. Exactly. Like give them something they can visualize. Right. And he even talks about how um, John D. Rockefeller okay. used to do this with his um, financial reports. Okay. He would actually, he had his employees gather around a table. Okay. And he would rake coins across the table to represent income and expenses. Oh. So that they could really see. See it, yeah. Where the money was going. That's amazing. Right. I bet those employees were very engaged. Right. Like, you remember that? Yes. So clear language. Okay. Crucial. And then he also talks about the power of repetition. 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 Okay. He even quotes Napoleon who said, repetition is the only serious principle of rhetoric. Wow. Okay. So... 
don't be afraid to reiterate exactly. those main points. He says, find different ways to rephrase your ideas, mm -hmm. use stories, right. examples, anything to kind of like drive those key takeaways home. Okay, that makes sense. Without sounding like a breaking record. Right, right. And then I guess finally, like, yeah, just not overwhelming people with too much information. Right, right. So he was a big believer in quality over quantity. Okay. He says, don't try to cram too much. Less is more. Less is more. He tells a great story about William James. Okay. Who was this famous mm -hmm. philosopher. Okay. And somebody asked him, they said, you know, you're giving this hour long lecture. What's like the, the main thing that people.